gay, straight, whatever you are, everybody feels alien. Everybody feels like they came from another planet. But mine was true. I <laughs> People are good. There's always the crazy one. There's always the, the fundamentalist. There's always the one who goes too far. There's always the one who shoots a bunch of college kids in a dorm. That doesn't mean we lock down society. There's always a fundamentalist who will say, you are wrong, God hates you. That doesn't mean we adhere to that principle. It means that we say, wow, that gives me, I may not be that far, but look where I do judge. Look where I do question. Look where that, my, whatever my religious bringing makes me hate on some level. Maybe I don't carry a sign. But if that's wrong, then perhaps my silence is wrong too. Hell goes on forever. The Lord Jesus Christ warned this generation. The worm that eats on you never dies and the fire is never quenched. And the smoke of your torment ascendeth up forever and ever. God hates America. This nation has gone a whoring after strange gods. They wouldn't listen. He sent his servants onto their streets. He said, when I do that, you leave them alone. If you mess with my people, when I send them out to warn you, look at us. This is a little group of nobodies. You're doomed. This nation is sprinting to her destruction and you don't even see it coming. We're right exactly where the Lord our God put us and this is exactly where we'll stay until he sends us somewhere else. There is forgiveness, but not without repentance. This nation has no interest in repenting. This nation is in full on proud, arrogant, angry rebellion against all the standards of God. And furthermore, unless your God is Gandhi, get off that love the sinner, hate the sin. There's not one scripture to support that lie and it came from the mouth of Gandhi. Warn this generation to flee the wrath to come. Don't walk, run from all these lying false prophets that you've littered your landscape with. Stop lying about God, get a Bible, crack it, read the words and obey your God. Put away your false God, your idols, stop worshiping the flag and the dead and the military and start to obey the commandments of God. That is the only hope for this nation, a radical about face. And you're never gonna do it. To her people, all of them, God hates America, the servers home. God hates America, the dying soldiers home. There are fundamentalists. There are extremists. There are people who gave God signs. Um, does that mean we're supposed to listen to them? There are also people who are militantly gay. Militantly gay. I'm gay. That's who I am. That's all I am. I'm gay, gay, gay. And I'm going to glue glitter on my nipples and parade down the street. That's from anger. All this stuff that's from anger is, does not represent the norm. Most of us are just normal people, you know? with normal concerns and normal jobs and normal lives and normal loves and normal pain and normal sorrow and normal joy. And when we start looking for the differences between each other instead of the similarities, we're screwed. Growing up in Sand Springs was, um, it was a, a perfect environment to grow up in, you know? I mean, it was neighbors that you grew up with that you knew all your life. It was the woods across the street. It was, you know, the, the games and, the, and the, the history with everybody. And that sense of, of a protection to a degree because it was a small town and everybody knew everybody. Recognizing at an early age that I might be different or not even knowing what those things were made that safety awkward in a way because I knew what it was and I appreciated what it was, but I, just, I, I felt outside. And I also know that everybody, gay, straight, whatever you are, everybody feels alien. Everybody feels like they came from another planet. But mine was true. I, <laughs> I, um, you know, I knew that there were differences. I knew that there were things that I should not speak of. There has always been a don't ask, don't tell thing. And so, 
it was just awkward. It was, it was a secretive thing. And I was told by my father in the most loving way without him saying anything, he was afraid that if I didn't change by the time I was 13, and I remember that was the magical number, 13, then all these things were gonna happen. And I remember knowing on my 13th birthday, I didn't change. I didn't change, what's gonna happen? So uh, I think it was a happy childhood to a degree, but fraught with an awkwardness and a fear and uh, a little bit of a secrecy. My father was the high school band director in Sand Springs. So when I was five years old, I was in South Pacific, you know, I was in Egyptian makeup number two from head to toe and sang the little song and my father conducted from the pit and, and uh, I was in a couple of the plays there when I was very little. And yeah, very supportive of that. I also think there's an innocence about a five-year-old or a seven-year-old that is, you know, everybody dance for grandma, everybody wants their kid to, you know, play the piano or do it. But as I got a little older, it became a, a different situation certainly with me. And then there's also just literally the sexual uh, issues of it, the, the things in your head of, as you start to come into puberty and you recognize that perhaps everything around you that supports a way of life is not necessarily your natural proclivity. The idea of a choice, um, First of all, if I could choose now, I would choose to be who I am. I would choose to be gay. That's who I am. I can't separate one aspect of my personality and be the same person. It's basically, do I like myself? Am I a good person? Am I a giving person in the world? Am I the person that I was brought up to be and that I hope that I try to be? Do I have my God? Do I have my foundation? And if, if the answer to that is yes, and I'm a happy, productive, good citizen in the world, why would I want to change anything that helped create part of that package. I'll tell you, coming from a small town in, in the, the Bible Belt, no one would choose to put themselves in front of this boulder of judgment and, and uh, God punishment and sin and wrath. and No one would ever choose that. So it is the bravery of those who say, you know what, this is how God made me, this is who I am, that should be celebrated, not squashed. That always confused me, never understood that. So much of this obviously is about perception of God. Who is God? What is God's role? What is, and you know, there's homosexuality in, in all of nature, in all of nature, you know, is a penguin a sinner? <laughs> you know, I mean, and I for myself had to look at what I could find in the religion that I was taught and let go of the part that did not apply to my heart. I personally do not believe in a judgmental, vengeful, wrathful, punishing God. I don't believe when it bothered me after 9-11 when somebody said, you know, I walked out of the building just in time. God was on my side. I'm like, so God wasn't on the side of the person who was on the inside? The God, my God, doesn't root for the Yankees or for America or for, you know. My God is the, the, the spiritual being that I call on to help me be my best person. Not the, not the, the entity that will smite me, or damn you, or kill you, or plague you. And so much of the judgment about being homosexual is based on the idea of, of fire and brimstone, and wrong and right, and against nature. I left home when I was 15, first for a, a summer job, and uh, where I was singing and dancing. And I got to be with other people who felt that their calling was to sing and dance and act and create. And so I found this uh, new tribe, you know, and it's like going to college or going to a specialty school or going to anything else where you find those that are more like-minded in your specific thing. That also was very uh, 
helpful in me understanding that I wasn't by myself, I wasn't alone, I wasn't the only gay person. Although, the other kids who were there who might, who, who gay, they weren't necessarily, we weren't necessarily out, but you knew. They were different too, or they had the secret to, or they were afraid to, or they were finding themselves to. And so that really helped me to understand that I wasn't alone. And isn't that our greatest fear? I'm, a, nobody understands. Whether you're gay or an alcoholic or have diabetes, <laughs> nobody understands. And so when you find that in the world, people do understand and there are others who will celebrate you. I live in Los Angeles. I have lived a very long time in New York and I love where I'm from. I love Oklahoma. I love Sand Springs. I love my family. I love the community I grew up in. But I know when I come back here to play here, to the very people that I was afraid of, who are now saying, good for you. Our local boy does good. I didn't play Tulsa for a long time because I was afraid that somebody might shoot me on the stage because when I was a kid, I always felt like I was gonna get beaten up or um, chased or <clears throat> made fun of as I was. And it, was, and it made me angry when I, when I came back and they were like, we love you. Because I'm like, hold it. Don't be a hypocrite. You didn't love me when I was eight. You know? <laughs> but you know what? That was my judgment. That was my fear. That wasn't what they put on me. I think people have a perception you know, with the gay community in general, because when you apply the, uh, they're either in show business or they're a designer or they run the shop or they do this thing and it's all this glamour sort of, um, and for me in my own life, and I do, you know what, I, I, sometimes I pinch myself all the time because I work with people who I've grown up learning from and admiring. I've been, you know, in all these different medium and television and Broadway and all these things that were my dream. When I was about, I want to say like 23, I got a call from Elizabeth Taylor, who was having the first AIDS Project Los Angeles huge event that was fundraising for the new gay plague. That the president, Reagan at the time, had not spoken the word AIDS. It was this thing that was happening that no one understood, and she was asking the Hollywood community to come together to raise awareness and money. And there was no question. I mean, I won't, I won't bullshit you. It was Elizabeth Taylor calling me. <laughs> so there was no question. But also just, I knew, you know, when given the moment, we all know what the right thing to do is. And uh, the things that would have kept me, because I wasn't out, I was with a record company that told any public, every person I did an interview with or did any kind of junket at all, he doesn't discuss his personal life, don't ask, don't tell. And I wasn't out. But it was certainly a calling to stand up for something, for someone else. And, and I found out after that, she told me. I was the first person who said yes. She had called other people, and, and she had, I was a fan. I didn't know she was a fan. And she had called people that she knew, and they were afraid at the time. Um, and I found out that I was the first person to say yes. And maybe it was just I didn't... Uh, Maybe I was just going to whatever what, what would, should be true, or I was impressed that it was Elizabeth Taylor, or I'd recognized a need for something, but I, didn't, I wasn't afraid, which was a good thing. I wasn't afraid. What is this going to do to me? What is this association going to do to me? If Elizabeth Taylor was involved, how bad could it be? But you know what? I'm a regular guy in a regular relationship with a couple of dogs that need to go to the vet, you know, and uh, the laundry that needs to be done, and the car that needs to have the oil changed, and um, it's, you know, it's a normal life. You know, when I come to Tulsa and I'm dealing with whatever different, a press thing or an event somewhere or doing something and uh, I'll get a note or a call, well, my partner and I will be at your show, but shh, 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 shh. And I'm like, you're 45 years old and you're, you're not out at work, shh. And that breaks my heart. That really breaks my heart. The opportunity I find is for me to look at what's important in my life, what's truly important in my life. The people I love, the things, the moments that I cherish. Is there some friend that I need to apologize to, that we need to make amends with? Is there some family member that we need to say I love you to a little bit more often? 
Is there a friend that we keep promising we're going to call? We never do. That's the opportunity. When you're wearing Feeling small when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. I'm on your side, and when darkness falls. going to hell. I'm telling you, they're not. 